Thank you, Deacon. Um, I would like to begin by correcting really the um, last sentence. It says, a gifted preacher and scripture scholar. I think I need to amend it to one who preaches and reads scripture. I think that is a much more accurate reflection. I don't regard myself as a gifted preacher nor a scripture scholar. That said, I'll make sure this is amended in the future. The last time I spoke at the Eucharistic Congress was really the last time we were able to be together at the Eucharistic Congress. And that was in 2019. I had a paralyzed vocal cord at the time. I had to whisper into the microphone. I was honored to be able to give the Holy Hour reflection. It was a wonderful occasion. Little did we know that we'd have two years where everything would be virtual, but we're back. And we're glad to be back. And so I was equally honored to be asked this year uh, to be able to give a talk at this Eucharistic Congress coming out of two years of being virtual. However, I've begun to wonder if I should not be offended. I was not told that I would have to fo follow Dr. Peter Kreeft. And it seems to me nobody wanted that job. And I'm beginning to wonder what I did to Father Arnsbarger to be the one thrown in that position. I'll do my best. I really have three simple goals. Three goals for this afternoon's talk on the interior life. First, I would like to convince you that you already have an interior life. Second, I'd like to show you how this interior world of yours is Christologically arranged. And third, I would like to motivate you to give your interior life the attention it requires and deserves. Let's begin by first probing what you think about the topic or what is meant when someone says interior life. If you're sitting here and you're listening to me now, I suspect that your primary interest isn't in the topic of the interior life in general, but rather you have a more specific interest mainly your interior life, as well you should. But what do you mean when you refer to your interior life? In fact, let me do a little probing, ask you a few questions. What if someone were to say to you, describe to me your interior life? What would you say? Would it be easy? Would it be challenging? Some of you, in a moment of honesty, might say, what interior life? Some might ask, well, what do you mean by interior life? Others, might think about one's prayer life, devotions, spiritual habits, reflection, reading, the things we typically think of. 
In fact, you might begin to wonder whether or not the interior life has something to do with your moral life. You might think to yourself, well, I go to confession, and that seems to be about my interior life. So clearly, my moral life has something to do with this equation. It must be a part of my interior life, but in what way? In a sense, all of these things constitute something of the interior life. But more specifically, the interior life, I would suggest to you, refers to the interior world distinct from the exterior world around you. And let's begin there. That when we speak, and you and I are conversing right now about the interior life, we're talking about that interior world that is within you distinct from the exterior world outside of you. So this brings me to my first point. Specifically, that you should know that you already have an interior life. And for those of you who responded to my question saying, what interior life? This is going to be a wonderful surprise. You see, we all naturally engage an inner world. Whether you realize it or not, we have an inner room, a place from which we live our lives. It's the place where we process our innermost thoughts, feelings, where we form our intentions. It's here that we shape our lives even before they are expressed. Just ask yourself this question. Where do you spend most of your time? Where do you spend most of your time? It's in here. It's in your mind. And for some of you, I wish you would stop and pay attention to the road. Because, in fact, oftentimes we engage our interior world. When we drive, when we're sitting, when we're walking, when we're thinking, when we're having conversations, when we're contemplating what to do next with our lives. In fact, we even see other people's interior lives. We don't always think of it in that way, but we do to a certain degree. Do we not look at our children and wonder, what is going on in their little heads? All of this on the natural level, is an interior life. And in this sense, everyone has one. Everyone has an inner world where they themselves are informed by the lives that we lead, where they inform the lives outside of ourselves, but nonetheless remain interior. One could say, ultimately, that it's the place from which we live our lives. And it's true for all people, regardless of whether one has cultivated a prayer life. Or for that matter, whether one even believes in God. And although the fundamental laws of the human person remain the same for all of our inner worlds, each of us has different terrain 
different atmospheres, different landscapes, distinct and unique. So what is your terrain? No doubt, it's varied depending on which part of your life and self you're considering. Where are those places within yourself where you go to rest, to find comfort, to heal? Are there regions of yourself within this inner world that are in constant battle? A battle for control. Or in some occasions we feel that we've been victorious and in others we feel enslaved. Which places within ourselves frighten us? that are dark and we wonder if we ever dare to tread upon it. This brings me now to my second point. I've established for you that we all have an inner world. It's part of our human nature. But what does it mean to have a Christian interior life? To answer that, we look to Christ himself. But where do we see in sacred scripture glimpses of his interior life? I can note a few. They are but glimpses. For example, we see, generally speaking, in Scripture that our Lord goes off and prays alone. Usually to a mountaintop, But then we have more explicit descriptions of his interior life. At the Last Supper, in the Gospel of John, he prays out loud. He's speaking to the Father through the Spirit out loud. And this is a difficult thing to comprehend. Why? Because we're talking about the second person of the Holy Trinity, speaking to the first person of the Holy Trinity, through the third person of the Holy Trinity. This is by its nature, beyond us. Father, let them be one as we are one. Do you know how much ink has been spilled in contemplating what it means to say that the Holy Trinity is one and three? But we do have a glimpse. Indeed, we have the prayer spoken out loud. He wishes us to see it, to hear it, to reflect upon it. And then we have a moment, a moment that liturgically we're celebrating today, the Feast of the Transfiguration. That moment where on Mount Tabor, with a few of his apostles, he is revealed in his heavenly glory. This is but a glimpse of the interior world of our Lord from a heavenly perspective. They saw him transfigured in glory. But I would suggest to you that we have more than mere glimpses that we actually are able to see the interior world of our Lord laid bare. That we can behold it. You see, at the Last Supper, 
I believe that we see the first striking blows, the pound against the, the walls of the temple of our Lord. With the betrayal of Judas, a crack. With the subsequent betrayal of all the fickle crowds, the religious officials, his religious and civil condemnation to death, his scourging where his body is slashed, all of these are striking blows up against the very temple of Christ in which is an interior world. The weight of the cross presses firmly against it and the pounding of the nails, the final piercing of his side. All cracks open. The temple who is Christ and lays bare for all to see that which previously was hidden. Every time he went off to pray in silence in remote places, all that took place within him now, in this moment on Calvary, laid bare for all of history to behold a perfect, selfless gift. A sacrifice of self to the Father in and through the Spirit. The interior world is laid bare for all of history to behold. That is the interior world of our Lord. His life is revealed in a sense. That which was seen only by the Father and the Spirit is now manifest for the rest of us. And at baptism, the blood and water flowed from this temple of Christ, from the very side which was pierced. Through history, into your world. In that blood and water, the grace of sacraments that enters into your personal world organizes and arranges an entire religious world that otherwise wasn't there. You see, the divine presence that is received in that sacramental grace establishes a holy of holies within you, a tabernacle, an altar of sacrifice is created on which adoration takes place. Adoration of the Lamb. And all of this becomes the central and defining reality of our interior worlds and lives. The soul by virtue of baptism, is consecrated a Christian priest, a prophet, and a king. This means that by sharing in Christ's life, we become a prophet. That is to say, a teacher, one who evangelizes one who proclaims the truth of the kingdom. But sent where first? Sent first to evangelize the farthest corners of our very selves. The microcosm that is our interior world. And only then to the world around us. And so often we get this wrong. That we become bent 
on evangelizing and being a prophet for everybody else. And meanwhile, the terrain of one's inner world remains quite wild, untouched, unchanged. We become a king. That is to say, we share in Christ's sovereignty, seeking justice and offering mercy. But where first? Within ourselves. We try to do what is right and to make what is right, to render all their due, including God. But insofar as in our interior world, we have faults and flaws and sins and transgressions. The same mercy needs to be brought to bear. It's all too easy to proclaim mercy to other people. But the mountain of pride that we have to overcome to apply it to ourselves is extraordinary. And it requires this kingly mission of our baptism to afford the dispensation of mercy within. And we become a priest able to offer particular sacrifices such that when joined to Christ's sacrifice become spiritual and acceptable. That is to say, that every time you give up, say, meat on a Friday, or you're abstaining from something, or you're doing some other penitential practice, in your interior world, at the altar that is consecrated by virtue of your baptism, you, in your priestly character as a baptized Christian, are offering that sacrifice, approaching that altar, Now, the truth is we often make imperfect sacrifices. And as a result, we need our Lord to sanctify them. And he does. Now to the third point. The interior life requires maintenance, discretion, vigilance. One must be attentive and discern what one views, reads, watches, and entertains. Because if unchecked, the world around us will flood the world within with chaos, falsities, half-truths, and doubts that if not avoided or corrected will lead to inner strife, confusion, and even a misdirected life in search of false gods and illusions that promise fulfillment but only leaves one empty and despairing. But beyond merely protecting one's interior life and being prudent and vigilant, the interior world is a place where we live our religious lives. It is arranged and organized that way through our baptism into Christ for this purpose. You see, so oftentimes we might think about our religious lives and our religious practices as external realities, 
I went to church, I went to mass, I did this charity, I did this act of mercy, I did this, I did this, I did this, I prayed this devotion. Now to be sure, all of these external expressions are right and good, but they cannot exist without the concomitant interior reality. A place from which they flow. And what I'm suggesting to you, whether you realize it or not, insofar as you've ever gone to Mass with a pure intention, if you've ever done any act of charity in the name of Christ with a pure heart, or offered mercy and self-sacrifice because of your faith in Christ, whether you knew it or not, that there was an interior component unfolding. That within you and within your inner world, there is this holy of holies and you were making a sacrificial gift at that altar. You were offering it to the Father through the Son and the Spirit. Because this is the place where that offering unfolds. And you see, every time you come to Mass, and as we will offer and participate in Mass this afternoon, there's a moment that we refer to as the offertory. It's when the gifts are presented. It's when the bread and wine are brought forward to be consecrated. And then the priest, in this case the bishop, he will elevate them. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread to offer, the work of human hands, which become our spiritual food. And then he makes a silent prayer after saying the same prayer over the chalice. May these be acceptable. What is happening there is all of those sacrifices, all of those offerings that have unfolded within the altar of your world, even with their imperfections, maybe tainted by frustration, maybe tainted by anxiety, maybe tainted by just downright meanness on occasion, all of them are brought to this sacrifice where Christ at his altar the altar of Calvary, the one laid bare on the cross. He cleanses and washes them and makes them an acceptable offering to the Father joined to his. And your inner world then cascades upward into Christ's altar and then is brought higher up to the Father and in and through the Spirit. This is part of the interior life of the Christian. In this inner world, within this Holy of Holies, where stands now this altar of Christ? And the terrain all around it, as vast and varied as it may be, as rough or smooth, as dark or light. It's all here where the battleground of your soul unfolds and plays out. It's where we confront the terrain that is still a hostage to fear and darkness. It's where we retreat to find strength. It's where the battle for eternal life unfolds. And so in summary, I simply remind you of the three things I set out to do in this simple afternoon talk. First, to recognize and to convince you that you have an interior life. It's part of human nature. Second, 
that this world is Christologically arranged for those of us who are Christian. And in this arrangement that I've described, you ought to be, and this is the third point, motivated to give it attention that it requires and deserves. And to recognize that it is the place from which your very souls and religious life, that is to say, relationship with God, unfolds and plays out. It's my deep and sincere prayer for all of you that you are able to see it in these terms, to give it some form and shape, and that you're able to develop and to grow your interior worlds to even greater degree and extent and to bring the light of Christ to all corners of it and to continue to offer yourself and your sacrifices to God the Father through the Spirit in it all, always returning to the altar of Christ himself at the Most Holy Eucharist. With that, I just ask you that you pray for me as these beautiful temples of God and your worlds unfold. God bless you.